Uh, it's the time capsule, so that to me is just fascinating. I know you're like, wow, you had a lot of hair back then. I know. I didn't have no gray hair back then. <laughs> we won't we won't point that out. Um, but even just watching right now, like when I first started working at Skid Row, even the and I and I referenced it in the documentary. Some of our coalition members didn't like the word Skid Row. And that was a shift when I was working there. People really started taking pride. And it's like, well, why is Skid Row negative? Because they started looking at the things that were positive in Skid Row, and they were proud to be a part of this community and this neighborhood. So while I was working there, there was that shift that I saw occur. It was pretty fascinating that then folks were just like, we are Skid Row, we're proud of Skid Row. Right. We want Skid Row name on everything. Everything <laughs> must say Skid Row. So, so I thought that was, um, Pretty interesting, and um, I'm not going to do too much talking because we got folks right here. But what I want to do, I'm going to prompt, uh, I'm going to prompt the crew. I'm going to start over there with Roshan, and we're going to come on. Ladies first, and last. Ladies first, and last. <laughs> when we made the film, so this little background, we tried to be as uh, as faithful to the voices of the youth as we could. Um, and we knew there were different perspectives. So the fascinating thing with us is that we really didn't know all of the, and I'm, I have to give a slight disclaimer, like we really didn't have a relationship with any of the parents. And so that was just kind of interesting that we became like kind of surrogate parents. We became like this extra youth program. So one other thing I will mention, there were other youth programs that we weren't the only one that would say yes Central City Church of Nazareth, a lot of you participated yeah. in yes. Um, School on Wheels. Uh, there was also um, at the Ford Hotel there was youth pro there was youth programming in the in the hotel. So we weren't the only one, um, but we were a space that was culturally responsive. And you hear Franklin mention that. It's like it feels like counseling when we come here because people actually listen to us. Like people actually talk to us, they share information. And so so the young people just gravitated to us because we really took the time. You saw uh, Zavan and Socorro, some of our, and Leslie, rest in peace, some of our staff yeah. really um, were passionate about having these vibrant, strong, powerful voices, young people that, that really wanted to be heard, wanted to be seen, and wanted a be better neighborhood. You saw the, the po political response, as I always say, like, children shouldn't have to ask for this. We need to do something about it. This is terrible. That was over 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, so I just want to highlight that um, I don't want to downplay the challenges. We know the data. People that experience experience homelessness, their lifespans are shorter. People don't live as long as they should when they experience homelessness. People are subjected to um, to to traumas that they that they shouldn't have to be exposed to. And so we don't want it down. Like, so when the young people were talking, they was like, you know, we don't like living here. There are some things that we see here that we really don't like, that we're afraid of. And um, they, they were honest. That's what they were experiencing. So we wanted to capture that. But at the same time, we didn't want it to be the same narrative of Skiro is a terrible place. We wanted to show them laughing and having fun and their connection to the community. And so when they started coming to our office, um, they brought people with them that we didn't know who they were, but they were just, it was a package deal. <laughs> and so there were some older adults, there was some transition age youth, and they were all just, they all hung out together. So, but it was cool because the context that we created, and one of the, the people in the film, he made, he, he made a reference to like, you know, I saw Franklin doing positive, and I said, hmm, maybe I can guide him to do good things. <laughs> Which kind of implies that he was a positive influence, but I, I would not comment on that. Because whenever he was in the office, he was on his best behavior. So that's the other thing that was cool, is just that there were adults, transitional age youth, that found our space to be a safe space and a positive space. And so. Um, just, just to give uh, context to, to some of our work and, and how we were literally partnering with, with young people and meeting them where they are. So I want the first question I want to um, uh, throw out to, to the young people before I know y'all probably got a bunch of questions too, but I want everybody to just tell me just 
Um, what would you say was the, um, the one or two of the biggest things you learned just living in Skid Row and growing up in Skid Row? So that's the first question. It doesn't have to be positive or negative, just in general, just your experience. Um, and then I know some of these old images could be triggering for folks because uh, I heard some horror stories of the four old tale. So I appreciate you taking that journey with us. But um, just looking back now and just remembering, uh, what would you say uh, are some of the some of the things that that um, like the biggest impact you say living in Skid Row had, had on you, or some of the, the, the things that just stick with you about growing up in Skid Row. For me, um, yeah, it's been 20 years um, since I was uh, last on Skid Row. But for me, uh, one of the things that stuck with me is that everybody has a story. And that damn near everyone has gone through something traumatic. And it's just all um, in how uh, people chose to deal with it. You know, uh, whether it's substance use or whatever. Everyone has a story, a reason for why they ended up on Skid Row. So it's not just, oh, everyone is on drugs and, and alcohol and, you know, no, it is everyone, you know, has a story. I've got spoken to people who, uh, when you hear their, their story, you would have never thought, like, well, what are you doing here? And, oh, I was a lawyer, I was a doctor, or I had a good job, I had a home, I had a family, I had all this, and, you know, a series of unfortunate events happened, and now I'm here, and, um, and this was, yeah, 20 years ago. I was, you know, still a teenager. I was 13 when I first got to Skid Row. Um, and I was about 18 when I left and then came back at 19. Um, and it's, uh, my life has been, it's been kind of a roller coaster. Um, I don't want to say that being on Skid Row impacted that, but it probably did. And uh, just that experience, you know, led me to make some you know, not so good choices, but to come back around and uh, everyone just needs a chance and opportunity to just come around full circle, you know, however long that takes. And uh, people need a support system because, uh, you know, uh, this today's uh, world, everyone is just focused on themselves, you know, and uh, when you're trying to navigate the world without much of a support system, it can be, um, exceedingly difficult to to just move on and you know throughout the day um, i would i personally wish that i could say that you know the, the homelessness thing was a thing that has i'm like cause i'm experiencing it right now but it's you know you know it's a little different being an adult and being a single parent uh but you know i see you know good things in the future and turning around and that um and that yeah, being a part of the Skid Row community is not inherently a bad thing. And that was the, the purpose of the documentary, mm -hmm. showing people that live outside of the community that, you know, there's more to us than meets the eye, you know? And I'm sure prior to the documentary coming out, not a lot of people knew that there were even children, you know, living on Skid Row because its history has been, you know, filled with um, adult men. So a lot of people have already had this narrative about what it's like to live on Skid Row, the type of people who are down there, and you know, and so this documentary and all the other um, projects that we participated in it basically um, broke through that barrier and showed people like, well, we're, you know, we're more than just a homeless youth, you know, that we're people too, and we have a voice, and you know, and we got a chance to, um, Sound off. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Lamar is just one of those transitions. I'm putting him in transitional age youth category because you, Lamar, when he started coming around, he wasn't a little kid. But he was. It was part of the package deal of folks that was like, he's the homie. Can he come? Can he have some snacks too? Yes. Snacks for everyone. So uh, just Lamar, if you could talk about just, I would say for folks that don't know, maybe your experience just being at that time at the Ford Hotel and just um, what it was like and just how, how it had an impact on you. Okay, my experience at the Ford Hotel was a little rough in the beginning because 
I didn't know nobody. I was first down there. Um, you know, I wasn't really down there for good reasons. So I'm just gonna leave it at that. But uh, but when I got into it and started living in the Ford and started meeting the young cats, I think I met. Uh, I want to say I met uh, Franklin first because he came and, and introduced himself and started showing me the ropes and. and Wanted to know all about me and stuff. He was real friendly when it came to that type of stuff. And, um, and then I met everybody else, like Mike. I knew that was his cousin. He had some more friends, Big Trey News. Everybody was so friendly then, you know, because it was all like, it was a, a, a tight little Knicks family. You know, everybody had different floors. We all was, it was cool. When I first moved in, like after a while, we get to hanging out and going outside and you know, and, and chilling and running up and down the building, and everybody just having fun. And I was just like, okay, this is cool. It ain't bad up in here, and all that stuff. But then when I go outside, you know, walk down Skid Road, and now it came on. You know, it's got to be a whole different mentality because of uh, situations and people. And now that I'm a little older, other cats is looking at me, and you know, it was just a different ball game back then compared to today. Four was raggedy, so I mean it was it was raggedy. I mean, but the people, it was the inside. The beauty of it, of the four, it was raggedy outside, but the people on the inside too. It, you know, it was like it was a tight knit family. Like everybody got along, everybody protected each other. You know, people. If people got into it with the homie or friends or certain people, you know, everybody's coming to their they aid. Everybody, it was just a nice little family mix, and you know, it was a tragedy that uh, the young lady got, you know, the security guard to help, and we was all on the balcony watching, and all the kids ran down there, all everybody that was, you know, closer ran downstairs, and a dude, I mean, you know, it was it was a tragedy, but you know, rest in peace. No, no love. Um, other than that, my experience really was, you know, when I first met Charles and, and they took me around into the coalitions, I really wanted to change my life and the way I did uh, things and and how my perception of Skid Row was. It wasn't no more of a bad, a bad spot. I learned a lot from the Skid Row community over these 20 years I've been out here. Um, and I know one thing, they never stopped uh, supporting me. They always, uh, always, even, even the homeless people, they, they, they look at me today and they always say, I'm so proud of you. And it always lifts me up. So it's just like, I don't want to never deny my, my people nothing. So that's how, that's how I am now. <laughs> Kevin lived next door, so I was embarrassing Kevin throughout the film. You saw Kevin when we were in those, so it's like, yes. Kevin, yeah, he's a little baby. That was a little baby. He's going to be grown. But um, Kevin lived next door. Uh, he lived at the Ohio Hotel, which is the, uh, uh, yeah, okay. I was like, I think it's called Ohio, yeah. And um, so it was a few doors down, but um, he, um, an interesting thing about Kevin, which I was, I bumped into him in the parking lot coming in right now and got here at the same time. I, I started reflecting like, we have multiple generations of youth. So, so Adeline was one, one was from one of our newer generations. She's the new generation. These are the OGs. <laughs> um, but, um, but Kevin was a part of every generation. Kevin yeah. was there at all the, and I was like, you know, I thought about that. You was a part of every generation. So the, the cool thing about, um, and not to embarrass uh, um, Kevin and Lamar, but uh, like Lamar said, we've always been connected. Um, and even to Roshan's point, that we try to just stay in touch with everybody and if we can offer support, whatever we can do, because it is community, so it's extended. And that's part of what our follow-up piece is, is showing, is this, this, the power of community and connection. And, and for us, it's like the prevention work we do, uh, people always want to know, how do you know you prevented something? 
how do you know your work is impactful? And a lot of times in our work, we're funded through the county every year. We have to do an annual report. So what did you do this year? It doesn't capture the stories of um, the lives that you affect and how you impact folks, how people stay connected and just reach out to you. Like we have folks on social media, like, oh my God, you guys are still there? Does the <laughs> still have the same truck? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, she does. <laughs> and so, um, but um, before I pass it to Kevin, so Kevin lived, uh, um, he wasn't at the floor, but he was uh, part of the youth group the original OG group and through all of our, our groups Kevin was around and so we were able to when we started um, advocating to uh, create the refresh spot they were two of the people that we first thought of and so um, uh, Lamar was one of the I think you were one of the first employees of the, ah, of the yeah. refresh spot right. so Lamar was there like day one 2017 he was there and so they both currently work at the refresh spot right. so that's just beautiful too, just to be able to um, come from the community and be able to give back to the community and to be employed, giving back to the community. Yeah. Just, uh, I just want to celebrate the work. Absolutely. So Kevin, we're going to back to you. Kevin. As a baby yeah. growing up, in, <laughs> no, just uh, what you can share, what it was like growing up in Skid Row and just what you remember most about you know, growing up in Skid Row. Um, well, to start off first, I was actually born and raised in Skid Row, so I didn't have to move. <laughs> so I was used to it, in a weird sense. My parents tried to shelter me, trying to hide it from me, but I was a noisy kid back then. I paid attention to everything. So even though I didn't know what it was, I've seen it, you know? And it's kind of hard to hide things from kids, because it's always there. And Obviously, throughout the years, I understood what it is, and I, I didn't want no involvement. I still don't want no involvement. But living part of Skid Row, when I was in school, I, I didn't care. I told everybody I'm from Skid Row. I Sometimes I got targeted. I was bugged, bullied, just because I was Skid Row. And I didn't care. Because Skid Row is just a name that I live from. It's not going to define who I am. I'm going to make my own history. And that's how I've been doing ever since. And being part of social model actually helped me develop myself. When I was young, I was shy and quiet. I didn't hardly even talk. They helped me develop my voice that I have today. And ever since I've been active, being constantly active, and using my voice to help people every day. And if it wasn't for the experience of living down here, I could have drowned differently. You know? And in a real way, it helped me develop. Seeing what people are going through, it's making me want to go help them. It's which is why I still remain here. I still live this girl. I want to do my part to help these people. No matter what I do, I want to give them my all and help out the way I can. And that's why I still been here, doing what I can, working with a refresh. Because if no one does it, someone has to do it. <laughs> I might as well take a step to it. That's right. <laughs> That, that rhyme, by the way, that's how I did it. I had a few years. That's what we took. Come on, man. I showed you how to hold your one. Now, I'm <laughs> now um, so last but not least, <laughs> Adeline. So um, I mentioned that we have multiple uh, iterations of our youth program. So, and I have to apologize. In the old, old days, we had snacks, but people weren't getting paid. But we ended up getting some funding, which was cool, so to give a stipend to young people. So as, as we moved on later, we were able to provide stipends for the young people's participation and their involvement in the community. And uh, part of what we did also was just engagement in the parks. We would go to the park and play music and just talk to the community and uh, participate in different events. Uh, but just to try to keep the parks active, but we were, that was something that was really um, an attraction, but uh, something that I think um, more youth programs should consider, you know, ways to, to, particularly when you're working with youth that experience extreme poverty, like snacks are good, but money is, it's money and snacks. <laughs> 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 and so, um, so Adeline, um, 
she ended up uh, participating in our group. Um, and then at this time, we had got a violence prevention grant. So mm -hmm. at this time, our focus was uh, around violence prevention. And so we had a different funding source. But uh, if you could just talk about your experience, what you remember most about your time living in Ski Row and, uh, and just how it impacted you. I got another question about positives. So it's just, just a reflection about living in Ski Row your formative years and how it affected you. Okay. Um, okay. So for me, uh, I ended up in Skid Row because it was my mom's experience domestic violence and um, she, uh, she tried to sell me to her boyfriend um, so he would pay the rent and because I didn't want to have sex with him, I decided to run away. Um, I ended up at Union Rescue Mission when I was, I want to say 16, um, I can definitely agree that the counselors did not pay attention because when I walked in there and I told them I was 18, they believed me. Um, they didn't ask me for my ID or my social security. Um, they just told me to get in line and wait for a bed. Um, but at some point, they were looking at me like, what is, like, why does she have all this, this, this duffel bag? We're asking her questions about social security and all this other stuff, and she's saying, I don't know what you're talking about. And so um, they moved me around, and there was actually a lady that lived in a tent. Um, at some point, they told me that I didn't come in time to get the bed, and there's a lady in front of the University Commission that had a tent, and she told me I could sleep in her tent. She said, you have nowhere to go, you come in here, sweetie. And she let me stay in her tent, and then afterwards, I would leave early, get to school, and I agreed. Um, I would have to like skip on the bus, not skip on the bus, but just sneak on the bus and take the bus to school, take a shower there. Um, thank goodness I was playing varsity basketball at the time, so I could use the lockers whenever I wanted. And, um, and at the same time, I had started the first uh, honor society at my school. Um, I didn't start it for positive reasons. I started it because I knew if I was part of the Honor Society that I could come into the school 30 minutes earlier and start the meeting. And so it just gave me an opportunity just to be um, in a building. And so around that time when I was playing varsity basketball, I actually met my current boyfriend who I've been with for, we've known each other for 10 years. And we've been together about to be nine in October. And he actually introduced me to Charles. And I remember just walking in and this guy was talking about your book and culture, and I'm looking at them, him like, this guy is crazy. <laughs> I'm like, I thought, yeah, I was like, it, I was like, I thought we were here to, I, I all heard was snacks, and I was like, I don't snacks. Snacks, like No, I actually, it was, I don't know if you remember when I, when I first came, I didn't know about the stipends. Um, so, I was really, it was just a snack. And so, I was like, okay, you know, I don't have to wait in line, and, uh, I had just got on the waiting list for the Covenant House California in Hollywood. And I remember just sitting there looking at him and just thinking, wow, like this guy, he knows so much. And I was just listening to him. And I remember him like watching as these were just coming in, sitting there, and they were like looking at him like, like he was the only thing that mattered in that moment. And I don't think if Mr. I don't know, but I call him Mr. Porter. I'm called Charles. I, I, I grew up that way. I call him Mr. and Mrs. Um, so I called him Mr. Porter, and he's like, "Call Charles." I'm like, no, Mr. Porter. Um, and I remember just sitting there looking at him, and I was like, "Wow, he's so smart." And then um, I would actually rush after school to come to um, Skid Row because at first I would just like try to avoid it and just go to the park and just stay away because I didn't know anyone and. Um, but then I would actually rush to go there because he knew so much. Um, I had lost my stepdad to alcohol poisoning because he didn't know he was diabetic. And he was taking his insulin and drinking vodka, little vodka, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, and I didn't see alcohol as a bad thing because he wasn't, I guess, quote unquote, an angry alcoholic. So when he would get drunk, he was actually more fun. <laughs> so when I came to Skid Row and I would see people drinking, I would be like, you know, they were smiling and laughing, so I just thought they were just normal people and that they were just getting a little, a little drink on. And to me, that when I would look at them, I would just see my stepfather. 
Um, so when you talk about alcohol and other drugs, and I learned about methamphetamines, and we started doing surveys, and he said, here's $10, and I'm like, what's $10 for for doing a survey? I was like, ooh, okay, um, I'll do more surveys. <laughs> and um, I think what um, impacted me the most is like, as I was staying at Skid Row, I noticed that the people that they were introducing us to, to talk like at city council and stuff, um, so I remember he was like, you guys want to go to city council and talk for a public hearing? And I was like, sure. Um, and at the time, I remember Kevin Michael Key said, you didn't have a choice. <laughs> <laughs> and so I went, and it was really interesting to me because as I continued to come to Skid Row, I noticed that the people that should have been in power were the people that were around us every day in Skid Row. The people that had degrees and that could actually, that actually cared about other people. Um, I remember just going to public hearing for the very first time and noticing that every last person was on their phone while we were talking. <laughs> and so I was like, what's the point of talking if they're not listening? And, um, and I think that's when General Jeff started rapping on the mic, public hearing, and I was like, what is this? That guy's crazy. <laughs> and uh, afterwards he said, you gotta dot your eyes across your teeth. And um, so it was just, for me, it was, a really reflective moment because I thought I was learning everything there was to learn about people and stuff in school, but it was like a whole nother world of knowledge that I was getting from people that didn't realize that the knowledge that they were getting out was so impactful and so empowering that there's, that's something that you can't get inside colleges. You can't get that inside um, schools. You have to get that in life. And uh, I think it was more of a blessing that I was I don't see me winding up as homeless as a bad thing. I, thought, I think of it as a blessing because if I never winded up a skid row, I never would have met Charles Porter. I would never met anybody. So I was just, that was my impact. You're the first. See, the last of me. We're going to make that happen. I do want to say the, um, that and it has been uh, an honor to, to know these young adults. Uh, and to be part of their life, I think, as you saw in the documentary, like, just celebrating birthdays, that was like a big thing. We still do that with the park. If anybody had a birthday, happy birthday. That's important, but imagine you're a child and you know people have a cake and put some candles on it, like, and everybody, all your friends come and we, we party. We try to make a big deal out of that. So we're just, it's just a blessing to stay in contact with folks. And some of the folks in the documentary that got married, people that went to their, their weddings, they got children. And so just to have these different milestones. I went to a couple graduations, folks up here. So uh, I embarrassed them a little bit. So, you know, that that's always fun too. It's like, who's he? <laughs> he doesn't look like he's related to you. <laughs> yeah, I'm like they uncle. <laughs> and so, um, no, I just celebrate because that's also, sometimes the work we do goes above and beyond being in the office. And that's, I think that's part of what I learned working in Skid Row is that if you're really sincere, you can't just turn off and on the connections that you have. And so you got people that's texting you, calling you, sending you messages on social media, inviting you to, to events that you got to go to. Not all of them, but you got to go to some of them. <laughs> and so, uh, but that's part of just being human. That's part of being human. And I think um, that's just something I want to highlight just that, you know, because when I hear criticism sometimes about nonprofits and, you know, oh, you're just here because you're getting paid. Nonprofit world, you don't make a lot of money. Uh, uh, but you, I do get paid to do something that I love to do. But at the same time, the work that I actually do is way more than punching in and punching out. You know, so. Uh, but it, I also gain from the, the connections that we have. So I'm gonna ask one question and then we can open it up. My last question for y'all to go back is, um, if you had a magic wand. <laughs> so some of you still are have a connection to Skid Row, some of you don't have a connection to Skid Row, but based on what you experienced and um, 
how you wish Skid Row should have been or would have been for you? If you had a magic wand, what would you do to make Skid Row the best community for you? Like, what what is needed? Like, what would, what what would you say we need to make that that happen? So, magic wands, the best Skid Row. Okay. Um, if I had a magic wand, I would want to probably magically make every for anyone who's been in charge of funding when it comes to skid row housing who actually can sign the check off i would replace them with most of the majority of people in this room um because if you guys had the power to say yes just just do it just build that building build that apartment build those townhomes um i feel like i feel like the world of skid row would change dramatically um because I feel like, you know, I I didn't realize what, not, I think that's the main thing, I didn't realize what policy and how impactful being able to control so many people's lives. Um, just one signature can change anything. It only takes one day um, to change everyone's life and it only takes seven days to come up with a plan and it only takes 30 days to build a building. Um, and I, I watched the video on that one, this guy's doing Yeah, he did. I was like, wow, it's really impressive. And um, he was on it. He was like, I'm building this building. He built it 30 days. And so um, he's just trying to prove that architecture is really easy to come down to it. And so if I had a magic wand, um, Sorry, Mr. Porter, I'll put you to work for another 40 to 60 years. <laughs> um, for, for, for real, uh, for not, you know, I don't know how much they get paid, but, you know. <laughs> um, but yeah, I would probably put everyone to work. Sorry, I'm sorry, no. uh, <laughs> sorry Mike. You're all high. Catherine. <laughs> so, yes, um, yes. Everyone would probably be at city council signing off and just saying yes to whatever you have, you can to get people in the doors and coming up with a plan that you guys actually know works from being in Skid Row. Um, because people in charge, they've never like stayed in Skid Row long enough to understand the people and what they need. How do they know what we want? Or how do, how do they know how to really implement the plan that we have or the vision that we have in our mind? And so, um, yeah, probably just, Make all of you guys city council members and mayors and presidents or something. I know, I'm sorry, but I put you to work. <laughs> people see what's going on, they turn away mm. and act like nothing's going on. Mm. And we all have a voice. We might as well talk it out and see what's going on. Because some of the similar problems can be fixed by just talking it out and accepting that's going on. So instead of just ignoring it, talk it. You see it? Talk it. Those are the two main problems I've been noticing the whole time my whole life. Because if we're just going to ignore it, walk away and not talk about it. We're just letting the problem mm. increase and keep growing. So that's what I would change. Mm. A matter of our eyesight and our own communication that we all have. Mm. So we talk about president or president? President, president. You can talk president. Okay, well. Uh, how to make Skiro more better. How to make Skiro more better. <laughs> well, I would change the people heart. Huh. They think it and, and the way they, they, they perceive how Skid Row is. So, you know, I would have more people that got love in their heart, that's more caring, that's more open, that's understanding, that that got uh that got concerns about things, you know. I would change the people's hearts.
two decades since I last lived on Skid Row. So, um, I really wouldn't know like, what, what could be you know, done to make, make it a better place. Um, you don't have to say what, what could be done, but what is needed. What, can be what, would, what would make it a better place? You could go back to Roshan in the past, baby Roshan. What, if you had the skid row of your dreams, what would it look like? Well, I mean, the skid row of my dream, there yeah, wouldn't be one. <laughs> it wouldn't be one because, you know, uh, when I first, um, when I first came to skid row, the first thing that popped into my mind is like, oh, yeah, um, this is no place for, for a child. This is no place for people. This is like, uh, Skid Row was where people went when they were thrown away by society. So myself, I didn't really see anything good about it. I didn't see, uh, yeah, I didn't see anything worth redeeming. It was more so, okay, I, I gotta, you know, stay here for as long as I need to and then get out. Man, don't. Slam dunk. I got competition over here. Um, what I'm going to do now is. Uh, Mom, we're gonna take some questions. Uh, what time is it? In, well, I'm not sure to ask that question. Eight twenty-seven. Okay. I'm not gonna ask it because I see you looking like how much time do we got? <laughs> we'll take a few questions. Are there any questions from the participants here tonight? Uh, we'll take questions and also just uh, feedback, reflection, comments. They're, they're fine too. We'll take a few because I told them I wouldn't keep them here all night, but I want to come have some interaction because I've been talking more than I want to. Yeah. I'm just wondering um, how the areas changed since the movie was made. One thing that I've, I've commented on about that um, is the presence of children. So when we started getting more media attention, because frankly, after this documentary, he um, he got a gig with World of Wonder. World of Wonder, they do like RuPaul, some yeah. of the like, Hollywood stuff. Yeah. They hired Franklin. Oh. So Franklin had a job, and they had a little pilot thing that they were doing. It was like, um, where you could have your own, this was way back in the day, but you could have your own channel online. Okay. And they gave him his own little channel and it was called, it was, it was actually pretty clever. It was called um, Kids Row. So it was playing off the ski road. It was Kids Row. And they gave him high tech camera and, and paid him for footage. To, I gotta be politically correct. So um, I think for us with the, the the footage that he shot originally, we worked with him to try to edit the story because Franklin had access. So like like Lamar was saying, Franklin was very friendly, but a lot of people love Franklin. So he could talk to anybody and stick the camera in your face and, and you know, regardless of what you're doing. So he had a lot of footage of people, you know, smoking crack and just doing whatever. It's like, oh, that's a good question. <laughs> you know, it's like, but you can't show all of that footage because it's a, you know, you they're they're talking to him but they don't know the implications of what happens. Yeah, and where it's gonna end up. So we're sens we're actually we were very sensitive about that with our conversation with the folks here. And even what you saw in here is like, okay, um, cause you don't know how people will respond to it. But at the same time, poor people don't have privacy. And so it's easy to pull a camera out and film people who go in their house, because that's literally, you're in their house. Imagine somebody just walked in your house with a camera and just start filming. 
you know, how would that feel? And so that's kind of, uh, Franklin had that access. He could walk in your house with a camera. So, <laughs> so the world of wonder was paying them for that footage. And so they got a lot of stuff that I was just kind of, I kind of cringed the, and you know, the crazy thing too, like, so I'm gonna make this short because I'm talking way more than I need to, but I want to say with the media exposure, there was a political response. And so Franklin ended up on Montel show, yes. I like Good Day America, he was on Tyra Bank. Uh, we got a phone call from um, uh, Oprah Winfrey's people and they, he almost ended up on Oprah, but it didn't happen. But um, as there was more media attention at the same time, the county was trying to get rid of all the kids in Skid Row. Right. So there was a uh, supervisor, yep. Gloria Molina at the time, read a story of a, a child that died in a building in Skid Row. She was like, oh, this is terrible. Children shouldn't be there. There shouldn't be families here. We need to get rid of them. So they started the Skid Row demonstration project. And it was like DCFS and uh, it was a few county programs that all collaborated to go into hotels and give families vouchers to leave. And so it was a big push to get rid of all the families. And so while this is happening, you got the, um, What's that thing called? Tom Gilmore, the um, oh, yeah. what's that the the, the, the the name of that place? Restaurant. Yeah, the little restaurant. That was like that was when it, the gentrification started. Oh, Winston yeah. Street. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Pete's Cafe. Pete's, Pete's Cafe. Yeah. Pete's Cafe. So yeah. Pete's Cafe comes, and it's like, oh my God, what's happening? So then, like, all these people start moving to Main Street, and then the slap in the face. I will say that. They made it seem like if you were a poor family in Skid Row, then you were a negligent parent. You're subjecting your children to terrible things. You shouldn't be here. Now, while this is happening, more affluent families are moving to Skid Row. And they were posting, it's like, oh, we need high schools. We need schools. We need uh, resources for our children. And I saw one article that was talking about how people were so brave to move downtown in a time of change. So on one hand, people are brave, and on the other hand, they're, they're irresponsible and negligent. And they displaced the poor families. The folks left, they were sent to other neighborhoods. They celebrated the victory, because they're like, you know, we got hundreds of families off Skid Row, but the second part of that conversation is where did it go? If you're a poor family, you're not gonna move to a rich neighborhood. And so they were moving the neighborhoods that were gang infested. They couldn't go outside. Um, people, with kids were like, you know, we can't go outside. And they kept coming to our office. It was like, oh, what are you doing here? Oh, we hate where we live. <laughs> they moved us to, so, so part of the answer is that uh, you don't see the families here. The hotels that were referenced, the, this policy changes, like the Ford, it went from family housing to single room, SROs, occupancy. So that's still a big thing. People are like, where is the low income family housing? Mm -hmm. How can you really have a community if you can't have kids, if you can't have couples, if you can't have? So that's still a, a, a strong issue that hasn't really been addressed in the community. But that's one major change. A lot of the young people that were here were completely displaced. Sorry, I, I didn't mean to hog the mic. Anybody else want to talk about changes, the things that you've seen that have changed since, since then? From the film, mm -hmm. a whole lot of change. Yeah. A whole <laughs> lot of uh, All the corners change. They got a uh, hotel, SRO going up everywhere. Um, right behind McDonald's now, they got that, like, I don't know how many buildings. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of units over there. Um, yeah, that's the only thing I can say that changes. They, they got more development for the homeless and everything. They got a little bit more people uh, walking and, and driving around, uh, like nurses and, and, and care and doctor care and, and foot teams and I think um, for me, uh, I would say the, the language. Um, when I started going to Yusef, uh, Charles had us watch that video and then talk about it. And I remember just uh, one of the, like, some of the language that is used, like, thumbs, 
Um, that that is not that language is not used now in Skid Row. Um, I feel like people are more uh, sensitive to other people's plight, other people's situation. Um, but at the same time, it's like that that emphasizes how how the children looked at the world during that time, and and it also um, shows the impact of the advocacy that has happened throughout the community to change how we view each other within the community. Um, I think also uh, the parks, uh, the parks have changed a lot, and that's also through community advocacy. And also um, when it comes to Skid Row, I think overall people coming together to have these conversations. Um, there was, like Charles said, there's people who were part of Skid Row that didn't like being called Skid Row, and there's people who didn't like, um, who wanted to be called Central City East. And so now, I don't think I've ever met anyone who's ever said, welcome to Central City East. <laughs> they say, welcome to the world famous Skid Row. Yeah, that's right. Um, and that right there the was world the world famous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The one yeah. and only, it goes round the one and only. That's right. Catherine. That was a, a wonderful film. I, I never she 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 I know some of the OGs on the panel. I don't know all of you, but um, I think what's so fascinating to me, I'm so curious about, some of you have decided to stay in the community and work in the community, and I know that you must have like this really important special insight into how to talk to people, how to help people in the community. And I'm just wondering, like, what is that insight that you have? And does anyone want to speak about that? Because I know you have it, but I just would wonder if you could put it to work. Well, one thing I will say is Mr. Porter's favorite word. It's all about patience. Hmm. So one thing that we do over there to refresh when it comes to talking to a guest that comes to use one of our services, no, we give us patience. We ask what they need, comment and everything, whether they're active or not. We give them time, try to talk and see what they want. We're not just gonna kick them out just because they're like, oh my God, this and that. No, we're gonna give them time, see what they want. Because it's just all about patience in the end of the day. And there's a way to talk, we'll find out. We always find a way to do it. Yeah. yeah, I like that. Um, I think for for me, um, it's just coming as your authentic self. Uh, Skid Row community, they can smell BS a mile away. So if you come at them like, oh, they're gonna be like, what you want? Um, it was really interesting. I, I, I currently go to college and I was doing a project to Skid Row. And I was walking down doing like field observations and then just having natural conversations with people. And people were coming up to me and saying, hey, I haven't seen you in a while. And I was like, I didn't even know who the person was. I was like, what? And they were like, I see you. Last time you were wearing it. And they described everything I was wearing. And I was like, what is going on right now? <laughs> and and um, what was really interesting is I had two students with me. And while I was walking down from, I went to Gladys, the Refresh Bot, um, Get, uh, the St. Julian Park, and what I loved is that people were walking up to us saying hello, and it was shocking the UCLA students. They were like, oh my gosh. And I was like, yeah, everybody's cool over here. And they were like, but what's really interesting was that people were like, I've never seen your face, who are you? And we, through the whole tour that I was giving them, not one person, said, not one person said, I know you. Every last one of them called out the students I was with. And they're like, who are you, who are you? And that tells you that when you're in Skid Row, you may not think that no one's watching you, mm. but people are always watching you. And so when you work with people in Skid Row, make sure that you're always seen. Um, I'm one of those people, I'm like, I like to be in bed by 10 o'clock <laughs> um, or eight. But you know, but I always come like when I tell them, like I never, I work right now. I work with downtown Wood Center with the women. I decided to work with the women in Skid Row because I, just, I was there was a part of me like, why, like what is the homeless problem? Like what is going on? Like we have all these case managers in Skid Row. Why no. do I see so many women and young girls in Skid, um, Skid Row and. It came down to the point that there's just not enough housing 
at all. No. And the housing that is available is ridiculously high. trash and high and expensive. And, and I don't know what they think is going to happen after right. COVID. You thought things were going to change again. Um, and so working with the women in Skid Row, I just, I, I love it because they come at, they come to me and they tell me like, like what's going on. And when I come to them and I tell them the truth and I just give them like authentically what's happening, they, ex they accept it, it sucks, but they accept it. And, but at least they tell me, I've, I've always had, I've never had a situation where one person has gotten mad at me. That we actually have a conversation about the problem. Mm -hmm. And they always tell me, you know, I like you because you just tell me the truth. Amen. And you know, sometimes you get tired of being lied to. Mm. Um, I when I was going to when I was in the shelter, I was in the shelter for five years, and I hated when my kids manager would tell me, "Oh, I'm almost done. I'm almost there." And I'm like, "Ma'am, it's been three years. Mm. Um, if you can't find nothing, it's okay. You just tell me, girl. There ain't no housing. Uh, I'll believe you um, because when I was looking, I couldn't find anything, and it was." It's just, I don't know, it was just a wonderful, like, I feel like during COVID, a lot of people say COVID was just a horrible thing and stuff like that, but I feel like I really connected to people who live in Skid Row, like people that I haven't seen in a long time because we push to see each other more. Um, and we push to see each other more in the morning where I like to be <laughs> a morning person. <laughs> I'll wake up like six o'clock in the morning, it's fine. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm a morning person, and, and you know, a lot of people in Skid Row, they wake up early, really early when they have yeah. to do their 10. And so I tell them, hey, when you're up, you can call me. You know, making yourself available for them, even if you don't work um, in the same position you worked for, or even if I stopped working in Skid Row, I would still want to come back, and I would still want people to contact me and hit me up and just be there for me like I was there for them and just vice versa because I was one of the people that used to hate saying that your strangers are your family. I used to be like, that's that's not me. You have to treat your family like your family because you only get one of those. But over time, I realized that when you meet strangers and the way they treat you with so much love and compassion and empathy, and you sometimes don't get that in your own family, it's now I see why people say, Strangers can be your family, your friends can be your family. Um, I had this, when I was growing up, I always told people I would never thought of having kids because I didn't want to leave them in this world because I felt like this world hurts people and I didn't want my child to have to be hurt. But after I met Charles and everyone, I was like, I want to leave them in this world because it's a possibility that someone like that could be there for my child. Mm. Oh man, I didn't even cry. Yeah. <laughs> 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 the well, I'm proud of all of y'all. Amen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. Um, what was I about to say? Oh, you got a question? Oh no, I just want to say, you know, thank you so much because what you shared and what you've been through and what you know now is really amazing. I know what the fort was like in the 80s. I know what it was like for children. In 1985, I went on the news and I talked about it. It was very devastating down here for women with children. Mm -hmm. And every time I would walk across the street, the lady said, thank you so much for saying that. Because it broke my heart that I had to come down here. And, and this is where they sent me. I mean, I'm way at Venice Beach, and they sent me all the way, took my kids and sent me all the way down here to be in hell. You know, and when the kids talked about the guards on there, it broke my heart because that's what it was, the guards. You couldn't take a shower. You couldn't do anything, and the guards were supposed to protect you. And then you hear these kids says, well, if we would have had better guards, and that is so much true, you know. And that was one of the biggest things down on Skid Row in the 80s and the 90s, the guards. You can't even trust them, you know. And when they said that, oh my God, I knew exactly, I'm a grown woman and I know exactly. But 
I know what it was like in the Ford. I know how dirty, I know how everything in that place. But I like what the kids said. We was like family. Mm -hmm. No matter how many roaches, rats, whatever, people did stick together there. I mean, you could even go buy your dope there and be safe. But I mean, you know, in, in all the places in Skid Row, the Ford was like a standout. And to hear those kids talk about their experience there was really big because in Skid Row, there was no safe place for children at all. And for you beautiful people, brave, brave people, to have to go through that and sit here and talk about it and let the world know that you went through hell, but you came out on the other side. And you're out here helping other people to understand what love and dignity and compassion is all about. I just want to say thank you so much from the bottom of my heart because it's people like you that allowed me to make it. Mm. And I want to thank you so very much. Yeah. That's right. I want to, uh, I want to say it's people like y'all that encourage us to do better in our lives too. So I don't just think that because uh, you know we got here, I had a rough time. I was, I was a bad person back then. I was not a good person. But I went into Charles and Delenn and Socorro and Leslie and Kevin and everybody working at Social Model, I mean, I, I, I changed my life around because they encouraged me and I've seen the love and the support that they gave me every time I was even out there going bad. So, I mean, I want to thank Charles and, and y'all and all that and every, everybody else that, that been putting in the footwork before us. So, you know, it's y'all inspired, inspired us to, to, to even do better to help out in the community. So I want to thank y'all also. So Pleasure. thank you. Thank you. Right. I want to say one, one last thing. If there's a, we'll take maybe one more comment or question, but I want to say something that um, uh, touches on also what um, what Roshan was mentioning earlier, um, and and this conversation about um, what life that's experienced in Skid Row. And one of the things, I'm always one of those, uh, what's the half full kind of guy? I'm a half full kind of guy. So I'm, I'm the eternal optimist. I always see good yeah. in everything. <laughs> but I know that the world is made up of, of positive and negative. That's the balance. And so I, I don't want to downplay, like some of the things that you're hearing, some of the things that you heard in the documentary, it really shows like disparities and how certain people's quality of life is not at a standard that's livable. And it, and it lessens people's lifespan. Like these, these disparities are measurable, where right? you see that people's life is cut short because of the, the environmental context, because of the, the environment, because of policies, because of uh, institutional racism. Like, these are real things that really affect people's lives. Mm. And this conversation about safety and what, how to create safety and what the bare minimum of what should be expected in a community. I think um, that, that in Skid Row, that's been a challenge over the years because as we mentioned, there's this sense of connection, there's a sense of, of love, but there's also, um, I would say in a way, lower expectations of quality of life. And we kind of, it kind of gets normalized. It's like, well, what, you surviving? I'm surviving. Ooh, but folks don't need to just be surviving. And so I think that's something we really all need to, to strive to when we have the opportunity to say, like, people deserve more. People deserve way more than what they have. Because people will celebrate someone getting housed and, oh, they're not on the street no more. Wow, that's great. But what's the quality? What's the quality of that? I mean, and, and right now we're dealing with this issue of just overdose deaths and just People's like preventable deaths, heart disease, things that are that are taking people out of that. Um, I think just as a community, we need to just continue to support each other. I think the power of what you hear right now are, are people that understand who they are, their place in the world, their connection to other people, but they also know through experience that there are a lot of policies that don't work. There are a lot of promises that have been made. There are a lot mm. of resources that have been pumped into yeah. the community. And then there are some policies like um, what one of the interviews Franklin did when he was on Montel, 
Frank, Franklin uh, Montel asked Franklin, well, well, why don't we just uh, go to Skid Row and, and take all the, and we heard in the documentary, um, um, Egypt, she was like, we should just have spaces for women and children. She was saying, we should have spaces in Skid Row for women and children. So Montel asked Franklin, well, why don't we just take all the women and children and, and get them off of Skid Row and, and get them out of there and, and save them? And uh, Franklin expressed, he had the perfect response, and he said, you know, that's what the problem is, is that everybody wants to get rid of the kids and make them leave instead of fixing the neighborhood, Ooh. instead of cleaning up our Ooh. community. Because really, if the neighborhood is not safe for women and children, who's it safe for? Oh, wow. And so if it's not safe, that's the issue. What needs to be done so that the safety is adequate and the quality of life is good? And I think those are ongoing things we continue to, to struggle with in, in, our, in our community. Mm. Oh yeah, I was saying the plan. Was there was there any final comment? Yeah, that's exactly what I was doing. Exactly. I was like, Charles, uh, if there was one thing you could do different about the documentary and um, knowing twenty years what the change would be, was there anything you could do different now? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think I think a lot of times people think about things have changed, and you know, twenty years from that time on the landscape, right? Political um, things get a lot of things are the same. I think one thing that I would have stressed more in the documentary is this, um, at the time we weren't aware that of the, the whole political move to gentrification and displacement that was on the way. I think we would have talked more about that, about securing people where they are mm -hmm. and improving the quality of the housing right here and expanding it for the families. Because if you talk to the folks that are impacted they don't want to. They didn't want to leave the downtown. They didn't want to leave the neighborhood. They didn't like the things about Skid Row that nobody likes. <laughs> you know, like not feeling safe and you know just trauma exposure. Nobody likes that. Uh, but the the sense of community that everybody talks about having people that you can connect and relate to because I think that's a, that's a challenge and, and and folks are still connecting. But that's a challenge in. Um, what is the word, like housing retention, like housing folks. You can't just stick people in units. Mm -hmm. Like there's something bigger about um, what housing means to people and, uh, and that we haven't really figured out. We think it's just putting someone in the unit, they'll make new relationships where they live and everybody can get along and it doesn't work like that. So I think part of it is, is um, preserving the neighborhood and the folks that are here and improving the living conditions and, and having impacted folks be at the table to say this is what we need as a community. I think um, more of just highlighting the need to meet the needs of folks where they are. Because I think the original documentary, we were just tell, letting them tell the story. It's like, wow, look at this community and uh, look at what we experienced. Some people see it and they say, they go to this place and, oh my God, kids shouldn't be there, let's get them out of there. So some people did go there and we had to say, whoa, whoa, whoa that's not, we're not saying we need to get rid of the women and children, we're saying we need to do a better job of uh, meeting people where they are and, and having equitable resources in, in the community. So those are things I think I would add that we didn't really cover um, that that with the foresight now of some of the political forces and shifts that I think would have been impacted. But um, that also leads up to our follow-up. So the follow-up, we have, we actually completed it. We're in the final stages of editing. Um, it is a follow-up piece from an oral history project. So some of the folks that are here, we, we did interviews with them. And some of the folks that were in the, the original film that aren't here today. And just ask them like, um, what their life is like now, and how living in Skid Row, so, and even the question you asked, like what would you do differently, what should have been done, what could have been done, some of those conversations, just fast forward, some of what you heard today, but for us, like I said, it's just being able to document the work that we do in prevention, and the importance of community and connection, mm -hmm. really as the foundation of what you right. do. And so that's what we, we view uh, connection is the opposite of addiction, right. and this whole concept of 
and that's the hashtag we use, Skid Row Connected. <laughs> like, Skid Row Connected is the foundation of wellness. It's like having someone to talk to. And, and Kevin was talking about that, just communication, just talking to Roshan, talking about just having a support system. Like, these aren't ideal things. These are essential to health and well-being. We need to be connected to other people. We need to have people we can trust, people that listen to us, mm. people that are able to give us advice, and if they don't know, point us in the direction of, right. I don't know, but ask them. Right. <laughs> you know, right. they know. That is really essential. So the um, so stay tuned because when we release that, right. we're going to show like uh, just over 20 plus years how this group of young people working together, staying mm -hmm. together, partnering with us, partnering with other people that care in the neighborhood, how that impacted their lives. Because the assumption is that growing up in Skiro, they're doomed to failure. And, uh, and you see like the folks here are resilient. Some are thriving, some are still struggling because that's life. Right. And, but the reality is that they all know that they have the tools to, to overcome and to succeed. And, uh, I have one question I'd like to ask you, because you've been around a long, long time. I've been around a long, long time. Yeah, so my question to you is, from one to 10, how far has it escalated from one to 10, helping the community of Skid Row? First, I would deflect that. I think there are some people in the room that have been here longer than me. <laughs> <laughs> we got some long, long, long time. <laughs> um, no, but you work with the community. Yeah, you know, I would say that's that's a hard question to answer. I think, uh, and I think Lamar wanted. I think in your response, you're talking about people caring more and they work. I think that's uh -huh. something that. Uh, People that have lived experience will tell you like the quality of the service that you receive is important. Other people you know, that that and that's been a challenge here is like the what is that the feedback? It's never feedback on did you did you appreciate the service? How can we make it better? How was the experience for you? There's no conversation about that. It's like you either take the service or you're service resistant. Yeah, we right. gotta figure out what's yeah. wrong with you. And it's um, and that's not that's not balanced. And so I can't say that our organization is the only one that is compassionate, that cares about people. Because I think at all jobs there are some people that really care, and there are some other people that are afraid. They're afraid to work in Skid Row. They come to work to get paid. There are some, and, and I hear stories about you know I try to have a conversation. They had an attitude. There are some people that are just stuck in their ways and they think they know, well, I, I'm in recovery and I know addicts. And they're just trying to manipulate us. <laughs> and it's like they're not, they don't take the time to really talk. And, and I, I think that should just across the board be a value. Anybody that works in Skid Row needs to be patient right? and compassionate. Yep. And if you're not, if you don't have those qualities, then you shouldn't be here. You, um, because if you have people that are in vulnerable, situations that are already exposed to trauma and that further traumatizes people. It's not trauma informed to to have bad attitudes and be impatient and and to deflect and put the blame back on the person who's already struggling. So I think there are people that care, people in this room that do really great work and go above and beyond because it is what needs to be done. Thank you Charles. Thank you Thank very you. much. <laughs> That's all I got. Oh, you got a question? Yeah, I'll I'll do. Do. You had said a few minutes ago, I grew up here the first six years of my life, 78 to 84. So I know how hard it is. It was took by TCFX, illegal, which completely shattered my trust in anybody. Yeah, over the last, I just turned 45 a week before Mother's Day. I'm still slowly but surely getting around, even trusting myself at times in the presence of others because of my trauma. At certain times, especially around certain times of the year because of my military past, Fourth of July and New Year's. 
when it's someone with my type of background, not me personally, but someone that grew up like that, went to the military, basically from one institution to another to another, that wants to reach out for housing, but cannot trust the next person. How could that be worked out? Because I've seen it every single day, including when I first started. How can that be? How would that be able to Get remit like gate heal. Because mm -hmm. right before I got retired with my family, almost 34 years later, thanks to Facebook. Mm -hmm. And there's very few people that remember me from way back then because my parents nicknamed Stevie and Grimmers. How can people like that not only here in Skid Row, but other places at home be able to heal? I think one thing that is a challenge with some of the services, and to your point, there needs to really be like dedicated people that just walk people through the process that are consistent. So that's part of the building trust is being consistent. So when you, and that's a challenge in some of the work that happens at Skid Row is like burnout. Like people is like, oh my God, this job is so stressful, I'm trying to save the, the world and it's, it's hard. <laughs> and they, they're stressed out and they're not in a place where they're really reciprocating like positive energy. They're stressed out. And so people feel their stress. And so I think part of it is having like navigators that are really dedicated to helping people move from here to here that they really build a relationship with. I think that, that has been a challenge in some of these systems of care. And I think now they're trying to coordinate like data and information on people, but I don't know how that really translates into compassion. I think it, it it creates a funny space because the people think they know you because they have all access to all your data. And so there's a thing now where they're trying to help people by sharing data across different systems and say, oh, okay, yeah, this person, I know him, they, they've seen this person, they've gone here, they've done this. And so they have kind of like a profile of the person, but that doesn't translate into a relationship with that person. And I think that those are some things that really need to be worked out because on the provider end, they're making progress. So we're making more progress. We know all the doctor visits. We know how many times they went to treatment. We know where they're located. We know how to find them. But how does that build trust? How does that create a sense of, of connection to people? And that goes back to the feedback. Are they collecting? Do you feel safer now that <laughs> we have all your data? <laughs> you know, have, uh, are you are you at the um, the, the level of, of quality of life that you seek? You know, like things that we don't always center the resources, I guess, service delivery around the needs of the people, and I think that is important because, like you said, people need to be able to trust you and have those real connections because. You know, maybe the people closest to you and have an in-touch on it may not be the, the people that have always had your best interests or may have been people that harmed you in the past. And so um, those are things that are still a challenge. You know? So I would say back to the earlier point, there are some people that care, but overall the system's not really set up to establish those long-term relationships. And I think that's a, a challenge is to really have like, folks that are dedicated to helping navigate people through systems that are adequately paid and supported to do that. And I think it is important. And people that genuinely care and are responsive, I think um, it's, it's a work in progress, but uh, thanks for bringing that you know, to our attention. It's, sometimes people think it's just pumping more money into certain programs, but that's not always the answer. 
because sometimes I am very <coughs> really getting that feedback as to how to improve this this service that you're receiving, how to how to cut down on some of the red tape and the, 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 the yeah. delays. You about to say something? You look like you were trying to grab the mic. I sensed it too. Oh, grab it. working and like around housing, I it breaks my heart, but there's not that much housing when it comes to men. Men don't have the advocacy around housing or being housed that women do. Um, I had a guy come up to me one time and he was telling me I have no housing. I've been through a lot like I was in recovery and I don't like I got a recovery, I don't know where to go. They said I can't stay there no more and all this other stuff. And he said I think I'm gonna self identify as a woman and to get into this door. And he asked me, what did I think about that? And I said, personally, do what you got to do to get a house and roof over your head, man. <laughs> um, I would identify as an iguana if I could just live <laughs> in an enclosure, you know, being in the same space. And so I am appalled by how there's not enough housing assistance for men. There's a ridiculously amount, of, large amount of men that are homeless or houseless and they have to couch surf and and I and I always hear stories about how some men will go and say that they were told in shelters that they should apply for disability and act a certain way yeah. because it will get them in the door faster. Yeah. And they have to you know, if they do this and that they'll have a poop in their head. So I would always say just continue to advocate for yourself and always set those boundaries. No one knows your story. They don't know what you've been through. These case managers can say whatever they want to you. Yeah, your information passes on from housing corporation to housing corporation. But I always applaud. I always love the, the case manager I work with. Because I'm a senior career support specialist. I work closely with a case manager. And I love how she contacted me. And she said, you know, another case manager for another program told me that this client had did all this stuff and was just like, really hard to work with, but she's been working with us really well. And I'm like, I don't care what the other case manager said. She ain't me. And sometimes you just got to be like, if you meet the right people that make you, and I must take this from Elisa Jordan because I just heard her say it like a week ago, and I really love it, is that you have to be in a place, You some places you cannot have um, an opportunity to create a safe space. So she talked about creating a brave space. So you have to be brave enough to walk in spaces that you feel brave enough to talk to them. And if you don't feel brave enough to talk to them, maybe that's not a safe place for you. And that's perfectly fine. And I know that sometimes you're like, because uh, this is something, I'm, I'm saying this because I went through it. Sometimes I will be in places and I'm like, dang, I know that they can help me, but they're, they're giving me the, the cold shoulder, they're giving me I don't trust you, and it's like, I just came for help. And so I would want to stay just so I can get the help. But if that person you're talking to is the person you're talking to, go to the next highest person. I always say, if I can't talk to you, I'm talking to your boss. If I can't talk to your boss, I'm going to write a letter. <laughs> you know? And, or, uh, you know, I'm going to get a friend. Um, I always tell people that I meet that women who are, who, may not qualify for our program, I will go and I will call the people that they that could help them, and I tell you, you have a problem, you can tell them to call me, and I'll even try to help you out more, because sometimes you need those people in your corner that are strangers, but are willing to go out of their way to help you. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it feels like weird, because it's like, why is this person trying to help me? <laughs> like, I don't trust you. I, I had a lot of trust issues, I was really shy, I used to always stare at people. And I still do the same thing because I got to look at you to figure, figure you out. Yeah. And I know you start laughing because you got to probably do the exact same thing. So sometimes just keep doing that. You know, just keep just, you know, sometimes it's good to sign someone out, you know, to figure out who they are. And ain't nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I would like to round of applause for our So, uh, we'll get me out of here in no time, no time. So, I'm getting side eye. So.
So um, I thank y'all for, for hanging out with us on this Friday. Thank you for the, the great folks at Skid Row History Museum, Los Angeles Property Department. And uh, always an honor to, uh, to tell our stories and document our history. I think it's very important. Yeah. Uh, these are folks that are part of the history of Skid Row. And so um, I just yeah. stay tuned for part two. Yeah. And check out the exhibit, Thursday, Friday, yes. Saturday.